Caesar's decision to cross the Rubicon has echoed through eternity as one of the most momentous hinge points in history and has transformed a quiet provincial river into an instantly recognizable byword for crossing a threshold from which there is no return. But this recollection, 2,000 years after the fact, places the impetus for the decision on Caesar, ignoring the context under which he made history. Namely, that the continued escalation of events which led to the Civil War cannot be placed solely at his feet. Rather, it was an intransigent opposition led by Cato the Younger and a staunch band of optimate aristocrats which created the conditions under which Caesar had no choice but to take up arms and wage war on the elite clique which controlled the Senate. A true history of the Rubicon crossing does not begin with Caesar's command in Gaul or even with the first triumvirate. Rather, we must go back to before Caesar's birth. In 133, the tribunate of Tiberius Gracchus saw the emergence of contentious class politics in the Roman state. Without getting into the history of the popular reformers, it is notable that all of the leading men who took up the popular cause faced violent reprisals that resulted in the deaths of the Gracchi brothers, Glossia, Saturninus, Drusus, and Marius. As the popular reformers gained traction, with each generation the reprisals grew more heavy-handed. When Tiberius Gracchus was slain, 300 of his supporters were murdered alongside him. Just a decade later, over 3,000 populare supporters would be killed alongside Gaius Gracchus. The assassination of Drusus precipitated the outbreak of the Social War which may have led to as many as 100,000 deaths on all sides. But the bloodiest oppression of all came when Sulla cracked down on the supporters of Marius in a series of successive wars, purges, and prescriptions that would scar the Roman Republic for the rest of its days. It is in this context that we must place Julius Caesar's decision to cross the Rubicon. Had he resigned his command and become a private citizen, as Cato insisted, he would have been open to prosecution for the zealous tactics used in passing comprehensive land reform, the same issue that had been at the root of senatorial opposition to the Gracchi. Had he returned to Rome, deprived of the imperium that he had been awarded by the popular assemblies, Caesar would have almost certainly faced the same mob justice as other popular reformers. But still, isn't it selfish to begin a war only to save your own skin? Well, Caesar knew that any repression would not stop with him. Over the course of his life, he had witnessed the violence of the Optimate faction play out against reformers time and time again. If he was killed or exiled, the lives and well-being of hundreds of thousands of his clients were in jeopardy. Everyone from the officers, legionaries, and provincials who had supported him in Gaul to entire provinces which counted on him for citizenship after the war now faced an uncertain future. The people of Rome would doubtless be subjected to another round of brutal prescriptions, as the young aristocrats, the equites and senators who flocked to his banner, made lucrative prizes for those coveting their property. But even more numerous were the downtrodden plebeians of the city that would face violent reprisals under a new regime. Any simplistic analysis of Caesar's decision that views his life as the only one in the balance on January 10th, 49 BC is woefully lacking. In addition to fighting for the future of his supporters, Caesar also had both law and precedent on his side. This could come as a shock to those who view Caesar as a budding tyrant intent on overthrowing a peaceful republic, but the root of the conflict, Caesar's unwillingness to become a private citizen, was settled legally long before he crossed the Rubicon. Needing a 10-year proconsular command in order to be eligible to stand again for consulship, Caesar had wisely secured this by being granted successive five-year terms by the popular assembly. The Optimate case hinged on the fact that the second term was granted in 56 BC, allowing them to claim that it would expire before Caesar was eligible to run for the consulship again. Caesar's supporters claimed that it was always intended to be added at the conclusion of his initial term, meaning he would have immunity for the entire 10-year period between offices. We don't have the text of the law, but it's doubtful that a man with the foresight of Caesar would make an elementary error like this. 
The Optimates then sought to draw Caesar into the city as a private citizen by refusing to allow him to stand for election in absentia, despite the fact that this custom was becoming increasingly disregarded and Pompey himself had been named sole consul by the Senate in 52 BC, despite holding Imperium as the governor of Spain. This means Pompey never set foot within the Pomerium during his entire term as consul. Indeed, Pompey had even been entrusted with command of the Republic's armies by the Senate in December of 50 BC, and he was already raising troops for a confrontation with Caesar a full month before Caesar crossed the river. Needless to say, this was never put to the popular assemblies, out of fear it would be voted down or vetoed by a populare tribune. But when disregarding constitutional norms favored the optimate cause, there seems to have been much less opposition from the aristocratic camp, with even the grand men of principle like Cato granting their assent to this highly unconstitutional arrangement. In a just world, more of the blame for the Civil War would fall on Cato's shoulders as he tried desperately to reverse recent populare gains and recreate a nostalgia-fueled fantasy of a lost republic that never really existed. In the weeks preceding the conflict, Caesar indicated a willingness to step down and abandon his position as proconsul in Gaul, as well as disband the majority of his forces, contingent on Pompey taking the same path. Caesar's only stipulation was that he be allowed to maintain the governorship of Illyricum in a single legion, a force far too inconsequential to threaten Rome itself. But Cato had sworn a solemn oath to prosecute Caesar and stood in the way of valiant attempts by Cicero to find a solution which was amenable to all parties. As a true sign of his delusion and the hatred that he bore for Caesar, Cato cast himself as a prophet, proclaiming, now these things are come to pass which I have foretold you, and the man is at last resorting to open compulsion, using the forces which he got by deceiving and cheating the state. Anyone but Cato could see that it was in fact his steady escalation of the situation which was forcing Caesar to prepare for the possibility of armed conflict. Cato knew that Caesar could not abide unconditional surrender, and it should be no surprise that a man who was on Sulla's prescription list as a youth sought to avoid having a price put on his head yet again. Caesar was too proud to kneel before any man, and it's easy to imagine him brooding in his tent on the morning of January 10th after receiving news that the Senate had passed the Senatus Consultum Ultimum and instituted martial law. Mulling over a lifetime of real and perceived insults at the hands of the elite, this patrician outsider who had been raised from birth to think of himself as a world historical figure would reflect on the lives inextricably bound to his own, and how he was set to cement his legacy for good or ill by stepping across that provincial stream. For him, it was probably an easy choice to make, as he had just pacified Gaul and Britain, proving his mettle as a general equal to Pompey, but also rendering what he deemed invaluable service to a republic that seemingly no longer had a use for him. Acting with his characteristic boldness, he surreptitiously sent troops across the river in civilian dress to occupy the town of Arpin. But the general himself went about the rest of his day as though nothing were amiss. It was not until later that evening that he slipped away from a dinner party and connected with cavalry that were already waiting for him at the crossing. We don't know how long he meditated on this decisive action, but as he crossed the stream, he quoted the Greek poet Menander, stating, the die is cast, and ordered the advance that would result in four years of civil war across the entire Mediterranean. <laughs>